Hello, and welcome back to the Shaky Sonnet Show. I am too tight with Trek, sovereign mistress over a rack. And here we are once again in the sanitarium at the bottom of the down staircase in the permanently sequestered remainder section of an unnamed local library, which may or may not have a couple of lions couchant sitting docilely on the front steps, possibly needing a little bit more attention for the moment, perfectly content in the states of submission in which I have left them. Now, I'll set my whip to the side here. One hopes we won't be needing it, or maybe we will. Today, we're going to be looking at sonnets 132, 133, and 134. And if you think that may be a little more than you can take, that's just fine. We'll take care of it. Today, we find our beleaguered lover boy once again looking for love in all the wrong places and finding a little bit more than he bargained for. Finding, in fact, that three is a crowd. So all three of these sonnets are pretty straightforward little numbers, so we'll dive right in and waste no time. Starting with sonnet 132. 132. Thine eyes I love, and they, as pitying me, knowing thy heart torment me with disdain, have put on black, and loving mourners be looking with pretty ruth upon my pain. And truly not the morning sun of heaven better becomes the gray cheeks of the east, nor that full star that ushers in the even doth half the glory to the sober west as those two morning eyes become thy face. Oh, let it then as well beseem thy heart to mourn for me, since mourning doth thee grace, and suit thy pity like in every part. Then will I swear beauty herself is black, and all they foul that thy complexion lack. Well, there's a pretty little plea for mercy. Sonnet 132, first quatrain. Here we have echoes of Petrarch, of course, Sidney's Astrophil and Stella, and Samuel Daniel's Delia, which I have finished reading Petrarch's Canciones, which are the sonnets that most people are modeling themselves after in the Elizabethan age. Uh, and yes, there are the, the trope of someone a lover begging a beloved for attention and for a reciprocation of their love is a trope of the Petrarchan sonnet. Samuel Daniel takes the same tack. I'm, I've just started reading those and constantly within the first seven to ten sonnets, disdain is repeated over and over and over again. So this is a very traditional Petrarchan sonnet with straight-up sonnet cycle tropes all over the place. A mistress torments her lover, or rather an admirer, with her disdain, for his advances anyway, and the poor hapless lover begs her to notice him, and by notice I mean probably to sleep with him. The twist here for Shakespeare is in the color of the mistress's eyes, which are black, and it allows Shakespeare to play with the various tropes that he scorned in Sonnet 130. The interplay of mourning, mourning when the sun rises, and mourning when we weep in sorrow, lends kind of a fresh new take to these uh, lovers who have been comparing their mistress's eyes to the sun, and as a free toy thrown in, we get all the cultural, linguistic, and literary shades pertaining to lightness and darkness to boot throughout the sonnet. So I say that it's a fresh new take, but was it really all that fresh? Not everyone seems to agree. There was a German critic in 1881 named Krauss who believed that Sonnet 132 was actually 
an adaptation of uh, a sonnet from Sidney's Astrophil and Stella, which was published in 1591, from Sonnet 7, where we have this. When nature made her chief work, Stella's eyes in color black, why wrapped she beams so bright? So in Astrophil and Stella, we also have a mistress with dark eyes. So it's not the necessarily all the tropes of the of the bright-eyed mistress. Here we also have a, a dark-eyed mistress. So second quatrain plus one line. It seems that Shakespeare couldn't quite squeeze in the full idea into the fullness of the second quatrain, so it bleeds over into line nine, which makes for kind of a clunky reading experience, which I don't really mind so much because line 10, line 10 sounds so good to me. Um, and so I can forgive him squeezing past, bleeding past the second quatrain into the third quatrain to complete his thought. And in the second quatrain, here the lover makes this false compare that he had scorned in sonnet 130, and he doesn't do it terribly successfully. Truly not the morning sun of heaven better becomes the gray cheeks of the east. So the sun rises and turns the, the, the morning gray. And gray cheeks isn't necessarily the most complimentary thing that I've heard to describe someone. But truly the, not the morning sun of heaven better becomes the gray cheeks of the east, nor that full star that ushers in the even that ushers in the evening. That's half the glory to the sober west. So we've got the sunrise and the sunset. Neither one are as beautiful as the light that shines from the mistress's eyes. And that's another trope from Petrarch where it's, it's Laura's eyes that are really shining bright into his soul. And that's what captivates him the most. And that's what he goes on and on and on and on about the most as he goes through the sonnet cycle of his own sonnet cycle of unrequited love for this woman. So it's not a very successful second quatrain because he can't get all the ideas into one and he has to bleed over into line nine, but we'll give him a B plus for effort. So your eyes are so pretty when you pity me in the second quatrain. And then Finally, in line 10, we come to the big O of what we'll call the third quatrain. And if you follow it along in my discussions of the other sonnets, you know that I really love a big O in a third quatrain. And let's face it, everyone needs a, a big O every now and again, don't they, Dr. Frankenstein? <laughs> yes, they do. So the big O. O. Let it then as well be seen thy heart to mourn for me. That's a beautiful sounding statement. Oh, let it then as well be seen thy heart to mourn for me. Since mourning, M-O-U-R-N, mourning doth thee grace and suit thy pity like in every part. So your eyes are so beautiful when you pity me. Why don't you dress your heart in that same pity and become even more beautiful? And while you're at it, why not further cover your whole self, every part, <clears throat> excuse me, every part, and yes, I mean every part, in that pity? Because if you do, we get the couplet. Then will I swear beauty herself is black, and all they fell that thy complexion lack. So if you do this, I'll be in luck if you give this schmuck a pity date. If you do this, I'll tell everyone you're the most beautiful woman in the world and everyone else is a horrid beast or something to that effect. So we've got the Petrarchan sonnets, tropes, with a twist on the blackness of her eyes, and he tries to extend it out somewhat successfully, <clears throat> not as completely successful as one might wish. But then we move on to sonnets 133 and 134, which, because they are intimately connected, I will read 
one right after the other, and I will signify when 134 starts by raising my finger. Sonnets 133 and 134. Be shrew that heart that makes my heart to groan for that deep wound it gives my friend and me. Is it not enough to torture me alone, but slave to slavery my sweetest friend must be? Me from myself thy cruel eye hath taken, and my next self thou harder hast engrossed. Of him, myself, and thee I am forsaken, a torment thrice threefold thus to be crossed. Prison my heart in thy steel bosom's ward, but then my friend's heart, let my poor heart bail. Whoever keeps me, let my heart be his guard. Thou canst not then use rigor in my jail. And yet thou wilt, for I, being pent in thee, perforce am thine, and all that is in me. So now I have confessed that he is thine, and I myself am mortgaged to thy will. Myself I'll forfeit, so that other mine thou wilt restore to be my comfort still. But thou wilt not, nor he wilt not be free, for thou art covetous, and he is kind. He learned but surety-like to write for me under that bond that him as fast doth bind. The statute of thy beauty Thou wilt take, thou usurer, that put forth all to use. And Sue, a friend, came debtor for my sake, so him I lose through my unkind abuse. Him have I lost. Thou hast both him and me. He pays the whole, and yet am I not free. Well, 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 well. This all seems very familiar. And if you can't quite remember, cast your minds all the way back to sonnets 40, 41, and 42. And while you're at it, take a peek at 34 and 35 as well. Here we have a triangulation. Probably not the second occasion of cheating affairs, but most likely the exact same event that was described or bemoaned in sonnets 40, 41, and 42. I will just note as an aside that reading sonnet 133, I can't help but hear an echo of John Donne's Batter My Heart, Three-Person God, one of his holy sonnets. But since Donne's holy sonnets were not published until 1633, full 17 years after Shakespeare's death, perhaps Sonnet 30, 133 could have maybe inspired Dunn to take the idea to a, a much more serious and much more shattering level in his holy sonnet, Batter My Heart, Three-Person God, which it's a wonderful poem and I'll link it below. But back to Sonnets 133 and 134. It's a triangulation. There's been some dirty deeds going on. First quatrain, be shrew that heart, which is a wonderful line, that makes my heart to groan. There seems to be an awful lot of groaning going on in these sonnets in, in part two. Um, are these sexual groans? Are these groans of pain? Well, or are they both? I think maybe both, because we can't ignore the little masochistic uh, qualities of this narrator, and we won't ignore them. Second line, be sure that heart that makes my heart to groan for that deep wound that it gives my friend and me. And yes, it is a wound from Cupid's arrow. And yes, it is a vagina or at least it gives a whiff of one. Or uh, perhaps I could have chosen a better turn of phrase there, but there is an implication of a vagina in the word wound. And yes, I am a perv, I admit it, but no, I'm not making it up. There is support for this. 
in Shakespeare's use of wound as a, a sexual organ of a female in poem number nine of A Passionate Pilgrim, where Venus tries to stop Adonis from entering a wood. And so in order to do this, she tells him a little story. And I quote, once, quoth she, did I see a fair sweet youth here in these brakes, deep wounded with a boar, deep in the thigh, a spectacle of Ruth. So in my thigh, quoth she, here was the sore. She showed hers. He saw more wounds than one, and blushing fled, and left her all alone. So, yes, I know, there are some quibbles about the authorship, if Shakespeare was the true author of all of those poems in A Passionate Pilgrim, but the idea was there, and so I stand by my idea. These are very sexual poems in subtext as we go along. Um, so be true that heart that makes my heart to groan for that deep wound it gives my friend and me. She's been giving her wound to the friend, his old boyfriend possibly, or possibly just his best friend, and me. And it's not enough that you torture me alone by, by making me love you so much, but now you're torturing my friend as well. That's the full quatrain. And then we get to the second quatrain. Me from myself, thy cruel eye have taken. Okay, I'm enraptured with you, I admit it. And my next self, which is a pretty strong way of talking about a friend, you've not just enraptured me, you've enraptured my next self, my lovely boy, as we heard in Sonnet 126. And tell you the truth, it didn't bother me so much when I was messing around with him at the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, that I was messing around with you. But now that I know that you two are messing around with each other without me, that is just a dungeon too far, as far as I'm concerned. Of him, myself, and thee, I am forsaken. A torment thrice threefold, thus to be crossed. It's, it's not just bad that we're three, it's three times three, it's nine times as bad. It couldn't get much worse. And then we get to the third quatrain. Prison my heart in thy steel bosom's ward, but then my friend's heart, let my poor heart bail. So there's a lot of talk about prison and torture and enslavement here, and we've got this kind of a, a Russian, a Russian Matryoshka doll where there's one inside another inside another of S and M kink going on, or seemingly. Um, whose heart is enraptured by whom? My heart is imprisoned in your steel bosom's ward, but then so is my friend's heart, and my friend's heart is in me, so he's in me and I'm in him and we're in you. It just gets a little bit confusing, one after the other. After the other. And whichever one of you stays with me, I'll be the guard to that, which basically just stop being so mean to us, my, my friend and I. Um, we're both your prisoners, but stop being so mean to us. And then we get the couplet. And yet thou wilt. You will be mean to us. For I, being pent in thee, perforce and thine, and all that is in me. So, I am your prisoner. I am inside you, or I have been inside you, and take that however way you'd like. And because of that, I am yours. And all that is in me, everything inside me is yours, heart, soul, body, boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, or two, all that, all your powers to enslave me sexually is in me, I'll be a good boy. Or three, all that is in me, inside me. And again, Stephen Booth points out that the, the word all is another word for penis in Elizabethan times. So there are all these sexual implications going on as we go through. So I'm yours, everything I have is yours, including my lovely boy, but not really, okay? Really? You're killing me here. And there's a strong whiff here of dom, 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 dominatrix. 
but I think this dominatrix doesn't sleep tonight. And for those kitties who don't get that reference, I'll, I'll give you a little link below to, for your fix in 80s culture. So then we go directly into Sonnet 134, which is, which is a direct continuation. So now I have confessed that he is thine. And I myself am mortgaged to thy will, myself I'll forfeit, so that other mind, and we've got my next self and my other mind, that is a, a, those are strong ways of talking about a friend, if he's really just a friend. Myself I'll forfeit, so that other mind thou wilt restore to be my comfort. Still, so, okay, you've got him, you want him, and even though I love you, I'll give you up. I'll let you go. I'll forfeit. Myself, I'll forfeit. I'll let myself go from you. As long as you give up my lovely boy so that he can comfort me. Which is not a terribly persuasive argument. You get nothing. I get my boyfriend back. Second quatrain. But thou wilt not. But you won't do it. And turns out he doesn't want to leave either, you selfish whore. No selfish whore, you're the selfish whore. Thou wilt not, nor he will not be free, for thou art covetous, and he is kind. He's just being nice to you. Don't, you know, he's just being nice to you. He learned, but surety like, to write for me under that bond that him as fast doth bind. Okay, so we've got all this legal speak as, in a way, as a way of, of distancing the narrator from his own emotions. It, he makes it sound coldly legalistic, but his heart is really all twisted up into knots. But this, he learned but surety like to write for me. And whenever we hear about writing, we think of a pen and we think of a penis, and or at least I do. And the implication to me is all those things that he does to you that make you scream, Guess who taught him that? That's what I'm reading here. Maybe it's a stretch, but I'm stretching there, okay? Um, he learned but surety like to write for me under that bond that him as fast did bind. So he's as bound up in you as I am. And then we get to the third quatrain, which, ex which explains that a little bit further as we go along. The statute of thy beauty thou wilt take, thou user that puts forth all to use. You use your beauty to take and take and take, even with interest, like a user. And you're taking it, you're taking everything. You're taking him, you're taking me, you're taking every part of us too. And line 11, and sue a friend came debtor for my sake. So this implies that the narrator may have sent his friend to intercede for him with this mistress to say, hey, you know what, this guy, he really, he's really got it good for you because you're fine, you're cute, your eyes are bright, your eyes are, you know, just the dark that I like, your hair is beautifully black, and well, while we're here, turns out uh, he didn't make so much a case for the blood for the narrator as he made for himself and he ended up taking the prize for himself and that's the implication of sign of line 11. Um, the friend came as a debtor for my sake so him I lose through my unkind abuse I sent him to, to, to petition for me and you end up ensnaring him and now I lose everything him have I lost the couplet thou hast both him and me and hast with the sexual connotations, because if we remember Sonnet 129, which is all about lust, lust, had, having, and in quest to have, is extreme, and that's the sort of having that we're, we're experiencing in line 13. He pays the whole, and yet am I not free? And as if I haven't been crude enough, he pays the whole, W-H-O-L-E. And yes, it sounds exactly like another whole that he pays. 
And I'm not the only one who thinks it, even though I am a filthy pig. And yet, am I not free? I still want you, and I still want you both. You're doing everything with him, but like, really, I'm going to be left out completely, and you two are going to be going off? That, uh, that just That just can't happen. So... It's the same immature narrator that we had in Sonnets 40, 41, and 42, who wants everything for himself, finds out that other people is just as shady as he is, and uh, isn't all that happy for. So, gender. Is there a male or a female? Honkity, honk, 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 honk. We've got a party going on here. Dramatically. Well, in terms of, it's not necessarily a threesome. It's more like a triangulation. And there are hints of triangulation in whether it's perceived or actual in a lot of the comedy. So dramatically, this, this fits in with a lot of other Shakespeare's work. Narratively, well, well we've got this pitiful wooing in Sonnet 132, which on the surface is just a reiteration of all the Petrarchan conventions with a twist of the darkness of the, the mistress's eyes and hair, followed by Sonnets 133 and 134, which is this upsetting revelation of a double dealing, which I really do think lends credence to my reading of Sonnet 129, the, the lust in action poem, as a backsliding into lust with the previous lover and not necessarily casting aspersions on the mistress. But I would allow. Now we see that they're all kind of doing dirty dealings. And so the lust may be self-imposed and it may be uh, just recognizing that lust is a problem for everyone and has led to this complicated situation. So if we were to take this as in isolation, we could read 132 as a fresh take on a man wooing a woman, and sonnets 133 and 134 can be seen as a man enraptured by a woman that he just can't quit, even after finding out that she's been doing the nasty with his best friend. Either way, ouch. Where do we go from here? Well, our narrator, we know, did recover from whatever shenanigans were going on in Sonnets 40, 41, and 42, so we'll just have to watch closely to see what happens next. Now, if you're new here, you may have never heard this before, but what I have to say, I think you should take to heart. As you're going through your day, look around, pay attention. The world is full of wonder. And you do yourself a favor by paying attention to all those wonders. And if you don't, who knows how you may suffer. Until next time, I am Two Tight Lechuk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.